Hi, Sarah. <laughs> welcome to all here in person, and welcome to all who are joining us on Zoom. We're so, um, we really are delighted to be able to gather together. Um, there's so much talk in our world these days, but when we get to listen to someone who is so clear-sighted and unsentimental and learned about that which matters the most to us, matters so deeply, it's time that we get quiet and we listen. And so I am going to take just a moment before we introduce our speaker to welcome all of you who maybe are not familiar with this physical building. Welcome to Emmanuel. It's our delight to have you here. We do require that everyone in the building wears their mask, please, mouth and nose, with the exception of whoever is uh, talking. So you will have the pleasure, we'll have the pleasure of seeing your face. Um, also, we, I want to orient you through these doors. You'll find the washroom on this hallway back here in case you need the washroom. Um, that's pretty much all I think you need to know about our building for tonight. Take out your cell phone, please. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I do mean it. <laughs> Take a look. Make sure that it's on silent. We're here, let's be here without interruption as best we can. And so, it is a delight. But formally to welcome you, I have the pleasure of inviting Bob Cates to come and make the introductions. Bob, would you please? My pleasure. I'll say from the Bima, thank you very much, Rabbi. And uh, I'll take this off, I'm allowed to. And thank you to the congregation who has been so welcoming and friendly and also to Randy, who I didn't meet, but with whom Rachel negotiated, and we got very good results working with her. Oh, I could, yeah, I can do that. So, uh, for those, I'm Bob Cates, uh, K-A-T-Z, which is the correct pronunciation. Everybody else gets it wrong. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, Canadian Friends of Peace Now is an avowedly Zionist organization affiliated with Peace Now, Shalom Shav in Israel. Little tiny bit of history. Peace Now was founded in 1978 when Menachem Begin was prime minister and Israelis dared to imagine a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, which at the time was unimaginable for most. 348 reserve officers in the Israeli Defense Forces, sorry, reserve officers and soldiers, uh, petitioned the government not to lose a chance for peace, and then tens of thousands of Israeli ca Israelis came out and supported them. And uh, this may have moved the government, we hope so. Uh, and then a group of very well-renowned Israelis, including Amos Oz, uh, Amir Peretz, other people who were quite prominent got together and founded Peace Now. Uh, to this day, Peace Now is Israel's largest and best known advocate of a two state solution. Canadian Friends of Peace Now is a non profit organization founded in the 1980s, presently has chapters in Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa, supporters across Canada and we are dedicated to the security and human rights of all Israelis as well as Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza uh, who are usually forgotten. So that's just who we are. Um, Yossi Alfer, who's behind me, uh, and you've probably read the biography. If you haven't, it's on this. So I'm gonna be really quick. He is a former officer in the Mossad. He's well known as a writer, speaker, columnist on Israeli security. And if you follow our sister organization, Americans for Peace Now, he is frequently doing podcasts for them, which are usually really interesting. Uh, he won a prize for a book called The Periphery, Israel's Search for Middle East Allies, 
There are several other notable books. Tonight he's going to be talking to us about Death Tango, and I am quite pleased, anybody who gets hold of this, uh, we were able to negotiate with his publisher, Roman and Littlefield, to get a 30% discount on three of his books, not just on Death Tango. Uh, they're expensive because it's US dollars, but uh, at least one of them I have read, and it was really worth it. So just one last thing. We're not going to have a live question and answer because we're streaming this, and it doesn't work to have uh, people ask questions from the audience. So we're going to be distributing little envelopes with cards and pencils. If people wouldn't mind writing down their questions, Rachel, where is Rachel? There, will pick them up, and Jacqueline, who is doing the question and answer, will read them from the BIMA and keep you all abreast. And that's Jacqueline Swartz. Ah, Zoomers, put your questions in chat. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn it over to Yossi. Nobody wants to see me. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I commend you for daring to come out. Uh, in the flesh to hear somebody. Uh, frankly, it's the first time in two and a half years that I've spoken to an audience like this, and for this I have to thank Canadians for Friends of Peace Now. Um, and uh, I'm not, this is not to denigrate those watching on Zoom, um, but it's a nice feeling uh, to give a frontal talk in front of a real live audience. And I'll try to hold your attention, I'll try to keep my remarks short enough uh, to leave plenty of time really open-ended uh, to the extent you're interested in, uh, in posing questions and, 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 and making comments. Uh, the theme of what I want to say is not pleasant and it's not good news. Uh, it's what I call the slippery slope. And it, it's, my, it's my contention, my argument, that uh, for some time now, uh, roughly 10 to 20 years, uh, Israel and the Palestinians have been slowly slipping down a slippery slope towards some kind of binational entity. Uh, what kind of binational entity? Nobody knows. Um, but this is the reality today. And uh, if I describe where we are at present, um, the slippery slope, in effect, becomes the default option. There are no negotiations. There is no prospect of negotiations. Uh, there is no solid governance, either in the West Bank, the PLO, Fatah, or, or in Israel. We're now careening down another slippery slope toward a fifth election in, in the space of uh, some two and a half years. Uh, Israel is firmly in the grip of a right religious, often messianic, political mainstream, political mainstream, uh, that uh, when it talks about a Jewish democratic state, it quite clearly prefers Jewish to democratic. Uh, and that's its vision. It has no room for a two-state negotiation, no room uh, for uh, any serious territorial compromise. And by the same token, the Palestinians are hopelessly split between the West Bank and Gaza, between the PLO and Hamas. The PLO, Hamas, which rejects any kind of negotiations with Israel, rejects a two-state solution, is, is, uh, rules Gaza, and is becoming increasingly dominant in the West Bank as well. Uh, Abu Mazen, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the leader of, uh, of the Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, is open to negotiation. Uh, but he has 
no room for maneuver. He is a weak leader on his way, on his way out. Uh, he, uh, when he has negotiated with Israel back in 2000, in, uh, in 2008, nine with Ehud Olmert, uh, he has a, not been able to come through with the kind of compromises that the Israeli public could accept. And that's all ancient history today. There are no negotiations, there no, there's no prospect of them. Uh, looking at the international scene, uh, in the eyes of the players in the Middle East, not just in Israel and Palestine, but elsewhere as well, the U United States, which has traditionally shepherded Israel-Arab Israel peace processes, and particularly Israeli-Palestinian peace process, uh, the United States appears to be on the way out of the Middle East, even with President Biden coming in uh, mid-July to Israel, to Ramallah, and to Saudi Arabia. No one deludes themselves that he's coming to get a negotiation started. He's simply coming to touch base uh, because the U.S. has far more urgent issues to deal with outside uh, the Middle East. Uh, nor is there any pressure from the Arab states for Israel and the Palestinians to negotiate. They have, a, at least four of them a couple of years ago, decided to normalize relations with Israel in return for a variety of incentives that, uh, that uh, the Trump administration uh, uh, offered them. Uh, but basically, they said uh, that uh, they, are, they have far more issues that compel them to deal with Israel than the Palestinian issue, and that they're fed up with the Palestinians' inability to come up with a, a solid negotiating uh, position. Uh, so there's no pressure from them. Uh, Israel's security community uh, is far more preoccupied with what is in effect an Israeli-Iranian war that has been going on for several years now, uh, and it is escalating. Uh, it is a war in every sense of the word, except what you see in the Donbas in Ukraine, tank battle, World War II style tank battle between the Russians and Ukrainians, and every other way, in the air, in the sea, on land, uh, in intelligence, in cyber, uh, this is a war, and it's a far bigger preoccupation for Israel and for its Arab neighbors, those who have recently normalized relations with it, far bigger preoccupation than the Palestinian issue. And of course, the rest of the world is far more preoccupied with the Russian-Ukrainian war uh, than with uh, is, uh, pro any sort of prospects for movement between Israelis and Palestinians. That's where we are. Where are we going? Uh, what form does this slipper, is this slippery slope going to take? Uh, when is it going to reach some kind of uh, end goal, if you like? We don't know. We simply don't know. Uh, there are too many variables internationally, regionally, uh, domestic on both sides, domestic, uh, a constant governmental change in Israel the threat of Hamas in the West Bank with the Palestinians, the very split of the Palestinians. Uh, uh, to, to, to be able to say what this binational entity is going to look like or when we're going to reach there, or are we already there? Uh, there's no precedent for it, quite frankly. Um, but it's interesting to note that more and more right-wing politicians of this of this dominant right religious mainstream are beginning to relate to the fact that we're heading for some kind of binational entity. Now I go back and I, and I repeat, for the right religious mainstream, the Jewish nature of Israel is apparently more important than the democratic nature of Israel, which is another way of saying they're prepared to live with this, at least for the time being until and unless it gets out of hand. But my own sense is that at some point, again, in years, in decades, we don't know, there's no precedent, at some point, 
this is going to become increasingly violent uh, uh, and conflicted uh, in ways that uh, you won't be able to deny, even the right-wingers won't be able to deny anymore. Uh, that sounds kind of Leninist. It's got to get very bad before it can get good. Uh, but quite frankly, at least if we take a snapshot of where we are, that appears to be the situation. Now, how did we get here? And here I refer to my book, Death Tango, because I, uh, a, a few years ago, looked back and marveled, marveled, not the word, wondered at the events of late March 2002. March 27, 28, 29, three strategic turning points that at least symbolize the overall turning point uh, uh, of, of, this, of this slippery slope that's going on with the blessings of the Arab world. Uh, March 27th, Erev Pesach, uh, the Park Hotel bombing in Netanya, the worst suicide bombing of the Second Intifada, killed, 20, killed 30 Israelis, uh, and uh, traumatized the country. Uh, and if we take that suicide bombing, that worst suicide bombing, as, as simply indicative of the effect of all of the suicide bombings that preceded it and that followed it uh, in the course of the Second Intifada, I think it's very safe to say that this was a turning point for Israeli public opinion, Israeli Jewish public opinion, with regard to a two-state solution. It's not that the public turned against a two-state solution, but the public said to itself, these guys who are sending their sons to blow themselves up and kill ours, us, wives, husbands, children, uh, are not partners for a peace agreement. I'm not gonna argue whether they are or not, but this is what the public concluded. They are not partners for a peace agreement. Uh, and uh, that has been the opinion of the Israeli public ever since. If you, if you look, you'll see that there's still something like a plurality or majority, thin majority of the Israeli public, which, in, which despite the influence of the right religious mainstream, continues to believe in a two-state solution. Continues to say, yes, we've got to find our way to separate ourselves from the Palestinians but we have no partner. And that has been the, the, the view of the Israeli public for the past 20 years, beginning, if you like, with that Park Hotel bombing of March 27th. The next day, as if there were no violence going on between Israelis and Palestinians, the Arab League met in Beirut for its annual uh, convocation and in this case, to ratify the Arab Peace Initiative, an initiative of the Saudi king. Uh, a, a Tom Friedman would say it was his initiative. Uh, there's a lot of controversy. There are a number of, uh, uh, in the course of writing the book, I interviewed a number of uh, former Arab former foreign ministers, uh, everyone taking credit for the Arab Peace Initiative. Uh, but in effect, uh, on that day, the Arab world, meeting in Beirut, said uh, we are prepared to normalize relations with Israel. Normal relations, that's more than peace. Normal relations, uh, if it solves all of its border disputes with the Palestinians, with Syria, with Lebanon. That was the deal. And uh, it was ratified despite the misgivings of people like Muammar Gaddafi and uh, uh, Bashar Assad, uh, who didn't really see themselves as partners for peace or normalization with Israel, but the Saudis had enough, were able to have enough influence, uh, and uh, a, the Arab world, in effect, said, here's the deal, Arab Peace Initiative, territories, for normalization. Um, 
The next day, Israel under Ariel Sharon invaded the West Bank, uh, Operation Defensive Shield, and a, in effect rolled back the progress made, uh, particularly in the security sphere, under the Oslo agreements of 1993, 94, 95. This is 2002. Uh, the IDF is back in the West Bank, and it has stayed there ever since. Even if in the day it's not there, at night it, they go, it, IDF troops go in anywhere they want with a wink and a nod from the Palestinian security services under Abu Mazen to arrest people uh, 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 and uh, bring them back to Israel for interrogation, trial, whatever. Uh, this was the end in a, of any security autonomy that the Palestinians enjoyed under Oslo, the day after the Arab Peace Initiative. Now, what has happened since then? Uh, in the course of 20 years, uh, there, there have been no attempts to negotiate peace between Israel and Syria. Israel and Lebanon, uh, one attempt by Ehud Olmert uh, in 2008 to negotiate with the Palestinians, which failed. Uh, there's been absolutely no progress. Uh, and a, in the course of that time, something is very serious has changed in the Arab world. Because not only have Egypt and Jordan maintained and developed their peace with Israel, particularly the strategic dimension, but no fewer than four Arab countries a couple of years ago declared they were normalizing relations with Israel. It's really only three because Sudan defected very quickly under internal turmoil. Uh, now we have President Biden coming to Saudi Arabia in mid-July amid a, a lot of speculation that perhaps the Saudis will finally join the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco in normalizing relations. I doubt that's going to happen, uh, at least not now. But this is the direction. This is the direction. Now, what caused uh, these Arab countries, who were instrumental in, in passing the Arab Peace Initiative, to turn their, in effect, turn their backs on it and say, well, there is no deal with the Palestinians. There's no territorial solution. To, with Palestinians, to say nothing of Syria, which has dis disintegrated into chaos and mayhem since 2011, and Lebanon, which is a barely functioning state, uh, but without any progress toward two-state solution, they have normalized. And uh, the, the most striking example of this was, this, was when at the signing ceremony when Israel and the United Arab Emirates uh, signed their agreements to normalize relations, the foreign minister of the United Arab Emirates uh, said piously, this is in keeping with the Arab Peace Initiative. What we are doing is following the Arab Peace Initiative. It's total hypocrisy, total hypocrisy. Uh, but what we have seen is that is the ability of the Arab world to manipulate the Arab Peace Initiative into a kind of rubber stamp for anything it wants to do with Israel. Uh, it's like, forgive me, f swearing on the Bible, okay? Uh, what has changed? Uh, one, 20 more years of being fed up with lack of progress between Israel and the Palestinians, and Arabs understand that it's not just Israel that's to blame, but the Palestinians as well, uh, despite uh, every, all the support they gave to Palestinian negotiators, no progress. Secondly, and perhaps more important, Iran. Iran looms as a threat, particularly in the Gulf, less so for Morocco, but particularly in the Gulf, as a threat that the Arab world is having a great deal of trouble dealing with. Uh, and. Uh, Israel is a potential ally, not a potential. It is an ally in, a, in combating the Iranian drive toward 
Germany, in the Levant, and in the Gulf region. Uh, third, a sense that I mentioned earlier that the United States is abdicating its role as the Middle East superpower, uh, and that uh, it, it, it can't be depended on. And, and if you have been following the last couple of years, uh, attacks by Iran or its proxies, the Houthis in Yemen or Hezbollah, uh, uh, missile and drone attacks against Saudi and Emirate energy installations uh, on their soil with Iran, of course, not taking credit, but it was clear where these, uh, where these instruments of destruction were coming from. And the U.S. did not come running to the aid of the Saudis and the Emiratis, and they paid attention to this. Uh, not just under Biden, under Trump as well. In, in general, this, this, uh, this dynamic of U.S. withdrawal, military, gradual military withdrawal from the region can be traced all the way back to the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003 uh, uh, and uh, the reaction of the presidents who succeeded Bush, Obama, Trump, uh, now, now Biden. This for the Arabs who are, uh, who are militarily inferior to Iran, who are afraid of Iran, is one more reason to normalize with Israel in order to establish uh, strong uh, defense, strategic security relations. Uh, and if this means calling it normalization, they're, they're happy to do it. A, meanwhile, the slippery slope. And if you want to see uh, another s serious stage of descent on this slope, look to May 2021, just over a year ago, when for 11 days we had another mini war with Hamas in Gaza. Uh, but this one was different. Usually the many wars are Hamas sends missiles toward anywhere around it from Beersheba to Tel Aviv. Uh, 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 Israel bombs. Um, the, eventually the Qataris or the Emiratis or the Egyptians, especially the Egyptians, intervene uh, and a new modus vivendi is, is negotiated whereby uh, various Arab principalities deliver money to the Hamas in Gaza and they promise not to fire more missiles for a while uh, and that lasts for however long it lasts until the next round. But what was so different about this round and why I would say it was a significant a, a, a point of reference along this slippery slope is that for the first time since 1948, we witnessed Jews and Arabs inside Israel fighting one another. In mixed cities, we witnessed Arab residents of strategic areas in the north of Israel blockading roads. Uh, we witnessed, and we witnessed Hamas in its bid for leadership of the Palestinians firing its rockets at Jerusalem, uh, where, it, where this little mini-war started with a, a conflict over uh, the Temple Mount, over the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, uh, over a flag march which Israel insisted upon on Jerusalem Day. Uh, and here is Hamas saying, uh, we're, hold, we're, raising the, we're holding the Palestinian flag and we're uh, making a bid for leadership of all Palestinians. Uh, Hamas, if, if, if you have noticed, has never attacked Israel or Israelis or diaspora Jews outside of Israel. It's now threatening to do that. Uh, in May a year ago, Hamas fired rockets from Lebanon for the first time into northern Israel. Uh, we saw conflict uh, in, uh, and it, it inspired conflict between Arabs and Jews as far afield as uh, Los Angeles and, and, and London. 
Uh, but the most worrisome part was what was going on inside Israel between Is Arab citizens of Israel and Jewish citizens of Israel. It was so worrisome that since then, the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, has been setting up a reserve force which will be charged at time of conflict of any sort with keeping the roads open inside Israel so that military reinforcements can be moved around. This is a half military, half police force. Uh, this is how far we've come uh, toward internalizing this conflict within Israel, among Arabs and Jews, in a way that is uh, uh, distressingly reminiscent uh, of 1948. Uh, let me conclude here just by w making a, a, few, a few points. One, a, don't misunderstand me. I still believe it, a two-state solution is the only way out of this mess. And I still believe that people like yourselves have the very important task of keeping that solution alive internationally, among global Jewry, Canadian Jewry, North American Jewry, elsewhere, because I don't see any other way out of the, where this slippery slope is taking us. Now, I don't know how long, where, I don't know how long it's, this is going to take. I don't know how bad it can be. Again, we got a dose a year ago of how bad it can be. Uh, but a, a, there's nothing engraved in stone in the Middle East. Uh, I'm sure you're, you've been around long enough to know that pred predictions about what's going to happen in the Middle East uh, rarely pan out uh, uh, as expected. Uh, I think the slippery slope is a, an important way of understanding where we are and where we're going, but I don't know where it's going to end up or how it's going to end up, how bad it's going to be. And yet, at the end of the day, I think it'll be bad enough in the eyes of enough Israelis that the two-state solution will come back in vogue and that uh, if, uh, Isra Israelis, uh, regardless of what Palestinians understand from this, and parenthetically note, Palestinian public opinion is moving more and more toward a one-state solution. Uh, roughly half of Palestinians no longer, Palestinians in the West Bank, I'm not talking about the Islamists in Gaza, who have no room for Israel in their scheme of things. But those in the West Bank who've traditionally been in favor of a two-state solution are, are increasingly, particularly among the young, younger generation, increasingly subscribing to the notion of one state. Okay, we'll be Israelis, give us our rights, we'll be the majority, we'll take over, because uh, it'll be a democracy, of course. Uh, But regardless of what Palestinians are thinking, I would suggest, I would submit that eventually a majority of Israelis are going to come around and realize that the slippery slope is, is the end of Israel as a Jewish and a democratic state, and that therefore we have to rethink the two-state solution. And as I said, uh, you guys have to be here. You guys metaphorically have to be here when Israelis come to their senses over this issue. Thank you. Questions? Okay, okay, great, great. Okay, could it be feasible for Israel to withdraw unilateral, unilaterally from parts of the West Bank, that is areas A and B? I'm gonna take these one by one? Yeah, yeah. take it okay. one by one. You is it, would a unilateral withdrawal be feasible? Uh, it's feasible. It is feasible. Uh, 
Let's begin uh, not with areas A and B, which are the 40 percent of the West Bank that is the — that constitutes the Palestinian Authority, but with area C, the other 60 percent, right. which is full, under full Israeli control. Uh, and that's — and that's where all of the settlements are. But there's still plenty of empty room there, and there's room uh, for additional unilateral withdrawals if an Israeli leadership is so interested. But again, the political — so it's feasible militarily, um, economically, uh, but it's not feasible politically because this — the current government and any likely replacement for it uh, in the foreseeable future doesn't want to withdraw, on the contrary, wants to hold on to Area C and make it part of Israel. Uh, and so uh, uh, that, that's point number one. Point number two, uh, if, you, if you had an Israeli government that was prepared to make some kind of withdrawal, or perhaps the, enough international pressure was put on Israel led by the United States and or led by the Arab states. This again, this is not on the agenda. It's not on the horizon. But let's imagine it's happening because things do change in the Middle East. Um, uh, I would submit that uh, there would not be a Palestinian partner for that move either because uh, the, the traditional Palestinian PLO response uh, to the idea of, uh, of unilateral withdrawal has been uh, this has to be part of a much bigger process. Uh, we want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We can't stop you from withdrawing, uh, but you're not going to get anything from us in return. This is not going to be the start of, uh, of some improvement uh, in relations. Uh, but I'm, I'm completely speculating here because I don't see any Israeli government that's likely to do this, and I don't see any international constellation of pressures on, of, on Israel that could, could happen in the, in the foreseeable future to make this even a, a contingency. As a kind of next part of that question is something that I, I've been thinking about for a long time as we've had many, many speakers and um, uh, people writing books and papers about what land swaps and things like that would look like. Are you impressed by any of these plans? Give me your last sentence again. Last Are you sentence. impressed by, there have been a lot of plans, a lot of. Uh, for land swaps. For land swaps, yeah, in great detail. We've heard them. We've heard them all. Are you, are you impressed by any of these? Well, uh, look, uh, when we have negotiated, going back to the 90s, and uh, into Olmert and, and Abu Mazen in 2008, when we have negotiated, we've negotiated land swaps. That is, the idea uh, would be for the Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank to include land swaps that would allow Israel to hold on to uh, at least those settlements that are near the Green Line, uh, armistice line between Israel and the West Bank, and in effect to hold on to a majority of the settlers and reduce to a minimum the number of settlers who would be inside the state of Palestine and would presumably have to leave. Uh, so all of this made sense and there was some measure of agreement. And undoubtedly if we go get back to negotiating a two-state solution, there will be land swaps and the maps have been drawn. The, uh, there are only two problems here. One is that the settlements are proliferating, including deep inside uh, the territory. And, and here you should be aware, fully 10 percent of the Jewish population of Israel, fully 10 percent, lives beyond the pre-67 Green Line uh, armistice line in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank. And that, and that percentage is growing. Because uh, and, and Naftali Bennett, Prime Minister of Israel, the guy who managed to push Bibi Netanyahu out of office, who's, a, who's pragmatic, who succeeded for a year at least in managing a government that runs from 
uh, Arab Islamists, merits labor all the way to the, the far, the pro-settler far right. Naftali Bennett is a former head of the Council of Settlers of Judea and Samaria. He's very pro-settlement. Uh, if the only thing that is restraining him today is the fact that the leftists in his cabinet pressure, threaten not to expand settlements beyond, beyond a certain amount. So uh, uh, one problem is that the settlements are proliferating. Uh, and here we get to the second problem. And here I refer you, and I imagine you're, you're alluding to what we recently heard from Yossi Balin and Hiba Husseini, who uh, launched a, a, a project, an idea, for an Israeli-Palestinian confederation as a stage in a two-state solution. Uh, and the reason they want a confederation is Yossi Balin's recognition that there are too many settlements to be able to reach a territorial agreement and to remove them without starting a civil war in Israel. Don't forget, these people represent the current political mainstream in Israel, mm -hmm. pro-settler mainstream. There are simply too many. So the, uh, under a confederation, they could stay in place in this concept uh, and live as Israelis on Palestinian soil. Uh, this would avoid the, pro the, the, the necessity of so many of, of ex more extensive land swaps because you would, uh, you would not have to withdraw uh, tens of thousands of settlers. Frankly, I don't believe this can work. I don't think you can leave Israel extremist Israelis uh, on Palestinian soil and expect them to be law-abiding residents of, uh, Israeli residents of Palestine, uh, and they would do everything possible to uh, torpedo this kind of ag an agreement. Uh, so this is another, if you like, another partial argument against, against the, the current concept of land swaps. But to get back to, I mean, if, if we ever get to talking about, if and when we get to talking about a two-state solution, it will involve land swaps, without a doubt. Okay. Here's a long question. What are the incentives or circumstances needed to encourage the Palestinians, Fatah, to hold free and fair elections, which is a necessary step to negotiations, we're assuming? And what is, uh, what is necessary to create a stable and representative government in Israel so that there is a prospect for negotiations. Uh, in the alternative, is it possible to create uh, a Jewish, uh, and Jewish and Palestinian civil society partnership, not government, to create a proposal that might capture sufficient support um, in the na internationally in the meantime? You want me to read that? <laughs> I'll get to it in a minute. I, I have one thing to add to the land swap uh, okay, great. question. Great. Because, because you all followed uh, the Abraham Accords, right. uh, the Trump administration's uh, contribution to Israeli Arab peace and normalization. Uh, Google the map of land swaps that uh, Mr. Kushner came up with. Uh, uh, and, and you'll get a good laugh, okay? Uh, how not to do it? Uh, how, how, how did, uh, I have no other, word, no other way to, to present it. But even, even the Trump administration, uh, which is, we all can, I think, can recognize, didn't give a hoot about the Palestinians. Uh, but even the Trump administration uh, did make some weird effort to talk about a Palestinian state and to talk about land swaps, even if they were bizarre and would have cut Israel into pieces. Um, but they felt they, felt they had, to, had to do this. They had to give 
the Palestinian state, which, a rump state by any definition, but they had to give it extra territory at Israel's expense in order somehow to theoretically make this work. Needless to say, this was rejected out of hand by, by the Palestinians. Now I'm getting back to, and you're gonna to have to repeat. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the last part was the possibility of a Jewish-Palestinian civil society partnership that would hopefully gain support. Look, look, uh, uh, back to the slippery slope. One man, of the, I mean, the, the violent manifestation we saw in May 21 in cities like uh, Jaffa and, and Akko and Lod and Ramleh uh, and in Palest and, uh, pa Israeli, Palestinian citizens of Israel building roadblocks to keep the police out. But there's another manifestation, and that is a great deal of civil society cooperation between Jews and Arabs in Israel. Uh, if you like, this is the nice face of, uh, of the slippery slope. Arabs are increasingly integrated. Uh, uh, Arabs are doctors, are nurses, are lawyers. Uh, you know, they're not just paving your roads and building your houses. They are professionals taking their place, a very respectable place in Israeli society. Uh, they're the people you'll see when you're taken to hospital because you're ill or, or injured. Uh, and, and, and who will take care of you. Uh, and um, they, you know, they, they've cornered entire sectors of the Israeli economy from cable TV to, uh, to um, transport and, and so forth. So, uh, and, and there are plenty of NGOs that deal with Arab-Jewish cooperation inside Israel. Okay, and they're not all leftist Jews. There are rightists as well, who, who, again, who see this. It, it folds into their notion of what, uh, of what a binationality should look like. Of course, in the rightist version, the Jews will always be on top, even if they're a minority, and they haven't quite figured out how they're going to manage that. Right. But. Um, but there's plenty of support in Israeli society for, for this kind of, of cooperation. Uh, and if, if, perhaps the most extreme example is the readiness of the Ram party, the joint Arab list, uh, under Mansour Abbas. If you, wanna, if you wanna point to a really extraordinary politician in Israel, it's Mansour Abbas, who is an Islamist whose party is in effect affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. That's Hamas. That, those are the guys who are in, rotting in jail in Egypt, okay? Uh, Mansour Abbas prepared to say first to Netanyahu, it didn't work out, but they talked, and, and, after, and now to Bennett, to say, look, I don't want to, I have no conditions for joining your coalition, I have no conditions that touch upon the two-state solution, relations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority or Israel and, and, uh, and, and the Gaza Strip. All I want is a better life for Arab citizens of Israel. Pave our roads. Right. Uh, stop, uh, uh, bring law and order to our society. Improve our schools. This is what I want. You can, if you give me this, I'll join your coalition and I'll vote for what in my eyes is a Palestinian one of the most obnoxious, uh, repugnant uh, uh, initiatives like uh, settlement expansion and so forth uh, in order to make this happen. Uh, this, is, th this is binationality working, if you like. Now, it's very tenuous. It could explode, it could disintegrate any minute. Um, uh, Abbas has taken a lot of Mansour Abbas, not, not Mah not uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Mansour Abbas has taken a lot of flack from his fellow Palestinian citizens of Israel over his readiness to abandon the sacred goal of a Palestinian state uh, uh, and, his, and his readiness to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Extraordinary. Uh, his fellow Palestinian citizens of Israel, those they're, they're, who's, their politician leaders in the Knesset, 
would never agree to this. They want Israel to be uh, some sort of binational state, uh, not, certainly not a Jewish state. Uh, and Abbas has, has done all of this, and he's succeeded in doing it, and uh, this was unthinkable just a few years ago. So there are interesting aspects of binationality that are actually registering progress at the same time that this threat of the, of the, of the, the, uh, the violence and conflict of the slippery slope is growing as well. A paradox. Um, what, in your opinion, are the chances for free and fair elections among Palestinians, and how could they get to that point? Free and fair elections among Palest Palestinians. Not Palestinian citizens of Israel? No. No, Palestinians in Palestine, yeah. in, in the West Bank and Gaza. Yeah. Look, uh, it's a good question. Uh, first of all, there, I, I see no chance in Gaza where Hamas rules. And to the extent that there are elections, there, the, the outcome is a foregone conclusion. Hamas is not, in, is not committed to democracy in the, in the pluralistic sense. Um, so you're not going to see, uh, and, 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 and you know, J they won't invite Jimmy Carter to send his election observers uh, to the Gaza Strip. Right. In the West Bank, there have been elections. Just recently, there have been local elections. Um, and then there haven't been elections. Mahmoud Abbas, uh, I think, was last elected 16 or 17 years ago. And he just recently postponed elections yet again when uh, his pollsters told him he would, he would lose them. Um, but th this is also by, by way of taking note that there are pollsters in the West Bank. Uh, there are reliable opinion polls by some very extraordinary Palestinian political scientists who uh, also do the polling, do polling in the Gaza Strip as well. There are reliable opinion polls. There have been reliable elections. Uh, I can't, I, I don't have any details as to where recently in local elections they were reliable or not. But they were broadly, the outcomes, and the outcome of the recent local elections uh, registered gains for Hamas and for Islamists, particularly in, in the Palestinian universities in the West Bank. Um, but the outcome has been accepted by everyone, which is a good sign for the, uh, the integrity uh, of those elections. And they allow international observers in. So. Uh, there's a very clear distinction here between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Right. And, and we have to note there, are no, there have been no elections for almost two decades for the president of the Palestinian Authority, who, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, and obviously this is, it's, this is not fraudulent elections, this is no election. Okay, the guy is, stays in office, continually postponing the elections, and everybody more or less accepts that. That's, that's hardly a mark of democratic society. You know, in the past, uh, many years ago, um, Haaretz editor Aluf Ben was here, and he was asked, we're speaking about elections, he was asked about, about whether Barghouti, a popular candidate, in jail for years would get released. And he said, yeah, he probably will be soon. I can't tell you how many years ago this was. Is there any move to release him so that he could run for office? No. And again, I, 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 again, bear in mind, this Israeli government, by agreement between its left, center, right, and Arab Islamist components, this Israeli government is not going to get into any kind of negotiating dynamic with the Palestinians, uh, which you would need if you're going to talk about releasing someone from jail, Barghouti, Marwan Barghouti, so that he could run 
uh, for, to be president of the Palestinian Authority. Right. I agree with Alouf, he would win. He, he might win from jail, uh, which would put Israel in an interesting dilemma. Is, is he released to, to allow him to take office or not? But uh, this is not in the cards because it, there, is, there is no prospect of any kind of Israeli-Palestinian contacts toward the goal of negotiating anything today other than the modalities of security arrangements in the West Bank and the modalities of some economic arrangements as well in the West Bank. Palestinians in the West Bank uh, do not have the same rights, as we all know, as settlers now. So aren't we already in a situation of non-democracy and Jewish domination? Aren't we already in that one state reality? Uh, some would argue that we are. Uh, I mean, you have all kinds of modalities of arguments about, uh, 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 of, uh, about let's say, with tossing around the word apartheid, okay? Right. Right. Um, does it exist where the Palestinians in areas A and B have autonomy and issue passports? Uh, and, and uh, exact taxes. Uh, does it exist in area C of the West Bank, the 60% where there are about 300,000 Palestinians? There are those who would argue that uh, even uh, relations between Jews and Arabs inside the state of Israel are apartheid type relations, which I would completely reject. Uh, and then you have a totally different status of Palestinians in East Jerusalem. They are citizens of Jerusalem, but not of the state of Israel. Um, I, would, I, I don't think you can, I, don't, I wouldn't argue that we're already in a one-state situation. Um, but the longer we go without out any kind of political process, uh, the, the closer we'll be to, I mean, the more it will be, we'll all be obliged to acknowledge this, this has become one state. Uh, if you're not negotiating two states for years and years and decades and decades, then you must be one state, but with a, th a, this fascinating variety of s different statuses of Palestinians in different places. And here, it's, it's those of you who followed apartheid in its day in South Africa, uh, they also had different categories for non-whites. Okay, you could be colored, you could be Asian, you could be Bantu, uh, you could be in some autonomous area. Uh, this is, I mean, th there's a frightening parallel uh, here as well. Uh, but I, I don't, I don't, I would, there are those who say we're already in a one state solution. One state, not solution, one state situation. Right. It's hardly a solution. I think we're still rolling down that slippery slope in that direction. Uh, you know, it'll, maybe 50 years from now, scholars will look back and they'll be able to say at what point this became, uh, in effect, a single political entity. Right now, I don't think it is. I think one of the big questions, and I'm kind of consolidating a few questions here, is where, where's the pressure to bring democracy uh, and a... Uh, decent solution to, to this issue? Where, where is the pressure in Israel or, well, f on Israel coming from well, the U.S.? Well, there's in Israel and there's on Israel. In Israel, again, political mainstream is right religious. It's not pressuring at all. Right, right. There is, there is a left wing in Israel, which is pressuring, although it's right now, it's enfolded in this coalition where, uh, whereby everybody has to agree we're not talking about the, pal the, the Palestinian issue, so there's no pressure there either. From the outside, as I said, there's precious little pressure. Uh, there used to be pressure from the Arab states. There isn't anymore. They're normalizing relations, or they're candidates to normalize relations, or they're so busy with the, what, what is left over from the Arab Spring in countries like Syria, Libya, uh, Tunisia, Sudan, 
that they don't have time to, to, to deal with this. They're not, they're not oriented toward pressuring Israel in any way. And the United States is not pressuring. You don't see any uh, move in Congress to criticize there Israel? Is a, there, is certainly, there are certainly those in Congress, and particularly in the Democratic Party, yeah. that criticize. Uh, has this reached some kind of critical mass? I don't think so. I don't think so, nor do I think this is the main issue on the agenda. There certainly is much more vocal criticism today from within the Democratic Party of what Israel does. Uh, I, would, I would venture that the, the right religious political mainstream is totally indifferent to this. It's totally indifferent. A and it would point to uh, initiatives like, uh, uh, what do you call the economic boycott? Uh, BDS. The, like BDS. Uh, and say it has had absolutely no effect on Israel. The economy is booming. Um, ben and Jerry's doesn't, don't want to sell their a, a, a chunky monkey in the West Bank, uh, that's fine. We'll manage with that just fine. Right. Uh, and what about the Christian right as, uh, as an important obstacle to any kind of uh, peaceful solution? The Christian right are the allies of Israel's right religious right. mainstream. And to the extent they have political clout in the United States, they certainly can I think outweigh the effect of, of the, the, the left wing of the Democratic Party, the squad, et cetera, uh, uh, who are criticizing Israel. Um, I'm not belittling this criticism. Uh, it, it, I mean, it is growing. There, there is a growing wing of liberal political United States that is increasingly critical of Israel. Uh, all I'm saying is, uh, so far, Israel has managed to remain generally indifferent to it. Um, and yes, the, the evangelical right is, or the support of the evangelical right is at least in part responsible for this. Are they still a critical force, the ev evangelical right? Right now, look, right now they're, they're not in power, okay? But their support for Israel, uh, oh, it's for critical. settlements, and No, et absolutely. It's financial, too, mind you. Exactly. There's plenty of money, uh, American evangelical money, that goes into, into supporting the settlements, absolutely. Okay. Here's a, um, sort of, here's a Zoom question. What do you think about the revived move to develop E1 in the West Bank? Well, all right, for those of you who are not familiar with the map, uh, E1 connects Jer Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, looking toward the Jordan River, looking east, with Maale Adumim, a huge settlement town um, a, that looms over the, the Jordan Valley uh, and uh, has been left empty, of, if you like, of, of Israeli settlement. Uh, under international pressure to ensure that there is a territorial link between the Northern West Bank and the Southern West Bank, um, which a territorial link which would, if E1 were closed to Palestinian uh, north-south traffic, uh, it, it, would, uh, it would in effect, to a large extent, uh, bifurcate the West Bank into two separate entities, north and south. Even as matters stand, it's a very tenuous, it's narrow territorial link to, to allow the tr transportation ben, between Ramallah and Bethlehem to go, to go uh, back and forth. Um, so uh, this is, uh, and so when, uh, whenever an Israeli government of the past, whatever, 20 years or so, uh, for the most part, right-wing governments, has taken the initiative to build a dwellings for Israeli Jews in E1 to, to, in effect, bifurcate the West Bank. 
This has aroused a lot of international pressure on Israel uh, from the United States, from the European Union, even here and there late, uh, uh, lately, even here and there from, the, from Arab states as well. Um, now this, so the, now this, and, and Israel has backed off. The, the relevant Israeli government has backed off. Now it's the Bennett government. Uh, I, I don't think this is going anywhere. I think this is more a part of domestic politics. Bennett, who heads a small right-wing party that broke off from the Likud, um, mainly of settlers, needs periodically to throw a bone to his ex-constituency, prospective constituency. Um, he's lost a lot of popularity uh, for, among right-wingers because he collaborates with the left and with Arab Islamists. Uh, but he has to make gestures like this, uh, and he's just inviting pressure. You don't take the initiative on E1 to build there with an, the President of the United States on his way to Israel and Palestine, so I don't think it's going to happen. Okay. Would you consider Gaza to, to currently be a Palestinian state in all but name only? Frankly, yes. Uh, and I think, I think this is the view of most, most Israelis. There's, there's almost no sentiment in Israel among settlers, among the settlers who, whom Ariel Sharon pulled out of the Gaza Strip in 2005, there's no sentiment to go back, uh, to take back land in the Gaza Strip. Um, there is a, a sense that there is a, an agreed border. A, it's not an international border. It's still a, an armistice line between Israel and the Gaza Strip, but it's been agreed between Israel and Hamas. Uh, the Gaza Strip has territorial access to the Arab world, to Egypt, to Egyptian Sinai, uh, for trade, for travel, whatever. Um, it certainly has the potential to, if it could live at peace with Israel, to uh, build uh, harbors, uh, airports, and, and, and function fully as part of the international scene. Um, and it, the only outstanding issues between Israel and Gaza in effect refer to the Hamas ideology, which is that it can't make peace with Israel, Israel has no right to exist, uh, it can't negotiate or won't negotiate with Israel. Uh, so I think it's a state in all but name, but that's an important distinction because nobody recognizes it as a state. Uh, and Palestinians continue to insist, even moderate Palestinians in the West Bank continue to insist that Gaza and the West Bank are an ent a single Palestinian entity and have to be part of some kind of solution, which of course only complicates the issue. Mm. Well, uh, Israelis would be happy, Israelis who want a two-state solution would be happy to negotiate with the West Bank leadership about a border between Israel and the West Bank, and the Palestinian state in the West Bank, and all of the other issues, the Jerusalem and so on and so forth. Uh, in, in the eyes of Israelis who want a two-state solution, there's nothing to negotiate with Gaza. There's no, no need for territorial swaps. Uh, there is a need for a link between Gaza and the West Bank, mm -hmm. which uh, t uh, some sort of ex-territorial highway or superhighway or whatever. Um, Train, train, train track. There have been all kinds of. Uh, I mean, in my days at uh, running the Jaffe Center project on 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 a two-state solution, we came up with all kinds of ideas of of, of what this should look like. Um, but the the deeper we get into the split within the Palestinian polity between Hamas in Gaza and Fatah in the West Bank, uh, the the more in Israeli eyes, Gaza seems like the Gaza seem, so it seems like a separate, a separate state. Uh, in, but it's again, it's it's not in all but name, because there's no recognition of this. There's no readiness to negotiate this. This is not on anybody's agenda to declare the Gaza Strip a state. Mm -hmm. 
Under a one-state solution, will the Jewish population accept a Palestinian Arab prime minister? And if not, how would they prevent it from happening? Well, I, I'm, I'm not advocating a one-state solution, okay? Uh, be, no, the, no, the Jewish population will not accept it, a Palestinian prime minister. Uh, and here, so here you get to those Israelis who are moving this, the right-wing, right religious settler majority that is moving Israel and the Palestinians toward a one-state reality. Reality, not solution. Reality. View this in non-democratic terms. Okay? Yes, you can find a fringe on the Jewish left in Israel uh, who would uh, be, accept a truly binational state and let the majority decide whatever it wants. Uh, and who recognize that even without the Gaza Strip, within another 40 years or so, there would be a Palestinian majority made up of Palestinians of East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Palestinian citizens of Israel, they would be the majority. They would elect the president. They would form, they would form the, head the coalition government. Uh, very few Israeli Jews want that to happen. Most Israeli Jews fear that this would not be democratic, it would certainly not be Jewish, uh, and it's the end of Israel. But you've got all kinds of interesting variations. The former president of Israel, Robert Rivlin, who was a Jabotinsky revisionist right winger, openly advocated giving all Palestinians the right to vote and ignoring the question, the demographic question. At what point does demography affect democracy? Simply ignoring it. But this is just by way of saying there are people on the right, go back all the way to Jabotinsky. He talked about a, 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 a the state, the Zionist state would have an Arab a, vice prime minister or vice president or something. He didn't know quite wh what it would look like. Uh, but he allowed for this. But it, the fascinating thing about the people on the right who advocate this because they covet the land and they understand they can't have the land without the people, the land of the West Bank, uh, and, uh, East Jerusalem, uh, the fascinating thing is that nowhere in their way of thinking is recognition of where this would lead demographically. Well, we're kind of wrapping up soon, but um, here's one of the last questions, something quite different. Once China becomes the global dominant, I assume, global power, what happens? Well, when China comes, I assume, becomes the preeminent yeah, global the, power. Yeah, dominant global uh, What happens? Uh, We've got very good relations with China. Um, we've gone overboard on some of the economic projects that the Chinese have, have advocated and been, and been taken to task by first the Trump administration and now the Biden administration for giving too much away, for, give, for giving China access to Israeli technology and technological secrets and uh, high tech and so on and so forth. So at, at this point, Washington has to restrain us from a, going too far in deals with China, okay? Because the Chinese offer good deals. Uh, uh, but to make sure that we don't give away too much strategically, just by way of illustrating, the Sixth Fleet uh, ships it can anchor in Haifa Harbor. But the Chinese are building two new sections of the harbor, and they will administrate them, administer them. And the Pentagon comes along and says, you, you expect our ships to anchor there when the Chinese are gonna be spying on us? That's typical of the discussion that goes on today. Uh, now, when the Chinese are the superpower, there'll no longer be a question uh, of, uh, you know, do, do we bow to 
Chinese demands to get into Israeli technology. I, you're talking about a China-dominated world. Um, look, just by way of comparison, look at Israel's approach to Russia in the Russian-Ukrainian war, okay? Uh, it is unlike that of the West. We've kept channels open. Mr. Bennett says he's mediating between the two. Well, he doesn't have anything to show for it yet, and he hasn't mentioned that lately, and he hasn't been to, gone to Sochi or Moscow to meet with uh, President Putin lately. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, essentially, Israel is saying, look, Russia is our neighbor. Russian forces in Syria, uh, naval, ground forces, air force, uh, are our next door neighbor to our north. Uh, we can't afford to anger them because we have to deal in Syria with I Iran's incursion and attempt to establish hegemony in the, in the Levant, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. And Russia, which has set up shop in Syria, is looking the other way. You want to bash the Iranians at 3 in the morning, twice a week, with your Air Force? OK, we'll turn off our anti-aircraft missiles and, and let you do it. Uh, and I go back to what I said earlier. This is the main security preoccupation for Israel today, not the Palestinian issue. It's Iran. And it's Iran to our north. And here, Russia is a factor. And with, with all of our empathy for the Ukrainians, and it's interesting to note, you've got about a million Russian speakers in Israel, Russian and Ukrainian speakers, two-thirds Russian, one-third Ukrainian, or in origin. Two-thirds of them are pro-Ukraine in this war. So you have, you have Russian Jews who came from Russia and now favor Ukraine in this war, and yet when it comes to deciding uh, whether we should play any sort of serious role in helping Ukraine, and the Ukrainians are asking for it, for instance, for the Iron Dome anti-missile, uh -huh. anti-rocket missiles, uh -huh. uh, uh, the first consideration is not Ukraine and not what Russian-speaking Israelis want. It's Syria. It's Russia and Syria. Russia is a Middle East power, and it's right on our flank, and we cannot ignore it from a security standpoint. Yeah. So that, that's why, so Israel has tilted and done, you know, maneuvered in all kinds of weird ways to try to stay neutral and not anger the Russians, but that just gives you some indication of what, how we would behave if we were facing China as the dominant global power, obviously, in the Middle East as well. Yeah. Okay, I think I will wrap it up by asking um, this question. Um, often, a new direction, um, positive or negative, comes from unexpected places, out of left field, as it were. Do you have a sense of, I mean, the, these are defined by being unpredictable, these unexpected places or directions. Do you see any positive developments anywhere, potentially, like the Arab world, for instance, or um, the, the non-squad, I would say, pro-Israel Democratic Party, or Europe? anywhere well well th this is a self-contradictory question because you begin by saying unexpected places if they're and unexpected I'm, I can't right. expect them uh, uh, no I, I'm, I'm serious things will change things will change things will change and and the, uh, the the factors for change will come at unexpected times from unexpected places because that's how the Middle East works uh, I mean, there are things I think you can rule out. The Arab world is not going to become democratic, okay? Uh, the monarchs in the Gulf monarchs are not going to abdicate in favor of the, the common people 
and uh, uh, whatever. Uh, revolution, recent, since 2011, revolution in the Arab world has failed. It has simply failed, and it's, it's all autocracy, whether these are monarchs or generals. It's all autocracy. That's not going to change. Um, the behavior of the powers, Russia, China, the United States, could change in the Middle East. Obviously, it, 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 it could change. And exactly how it would change, I don't know. Um, how American politics, you mentioned the squad, uh, the left, the, the, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, uh, the evangelical right, who vote Republican. I mean, how this could affect American attitudes toward Israel, it is, is hard to predict, but it, 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 it's a factor for change, without a doubt. Uh, and finally, but and most important, I say as an Israeli, uh, the slippery slope is going to affect us in Israel in ways that are very difficult to anticipate. And again, I give you that example of May 2021, totally unexpected, totally unexpected, has generated all kinds of uh, of, uh, of movements for change um, in this Israeli security forces, in Israeli politics. Mansour Abbas is a, 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 an incredible wild card, a guy you've got to admire. What can he, can he or someone like him have some totally unexpected and unanticipated effects on Israeli politics? Yes, it's possible. Stay tuned. Thank you so much. This was a Great delight. And, uh, Hi, uh, I'm Saul Ship. I'm a board member of the Canadian Friends of Peace Now. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline Schwartz. That was really well done. Uh, I think you really deserve a hand. And thank you very much, uh, Yossi, uh, uh, for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, for sharing your deep and uh, deep understanding and, and knowledge of the Middle East situation, and uh, especially for taking the trouble to uh, go through the flying to Toronto and putting up with our traffic jams and uh, at the airport and on the roads and so forth. Thank you so you much. You guys again. love bureaucracy. <laughs> it's incredible. It's Thank incredible. And, I didn't and expect it. It is unexpected. <laughs> Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Temple Emmanuel and R Rabbi Landsberg, and uh, especially to uh, Randy Feldman and Adam Roberts for making this event happen. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank each of you for turning out tonight. As uh, Yossi has already uh, indicated, he's uh, very pleased that you came out. And to those of you who are watching on Zoom, if anyone would like to support the work that the Canadian Friends of Peace Now is doing, uh, please go to our website, which is peacenowcanada.org, where you can contribute do a donation, or uh, you can find our previous webinars and where you'll be able to find uh, tonight's program in a couple of days. Thanks again, Yossi. Thank you.